Bienvenidos a todos. Este es nuestro último coloquio del semestre y, y para cerrar este, estas, las actividades del semestre, tenemos el gusto de tener con nosotros a Siamak Tati, del Instituto Bernoulli, de la Universidad de Groningen, en Holanda, quien nos va a hablar de la ergodicidad de automatas celulares sujetos a ruido. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me here. So this is my first time in Mexico and I'm really enjoying it very much. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you about some uh, recent work that uh, we did with, uh, mostly with uh, Irene Markovici and, and Matthew Sablik uh, on cellular automata subject to noise. Okay, so, uh, you know, these mathematicians and theoretical computer scientists uh, study these mathematical um, models of computation, like Turing machine, and they study what um, they want to know uh, what what can be computed and what cannot be computed, and what can be computed efficiently and what cannot be computed efficiently. But uh, when you want to implement these computations uh, using uh, physical components, or actual physical components like a transistor to build a computer then there are certain uh, extra challenges that you have to address. So one of these challenges is uh, uh, the possibility of errors. So you, uh, it's inevitable that every now and then there will be some errors, and the, um, the errors can, can be due to different things. Uh, for example, it, it could be the malfunction of the transistors, or it could be thermal noise, or it could be, I don't know, even uh, um, solar fluctuations, or many different things. And uh, so you should, you should be able to uh, handle this noise, the noise or error. And, uh, and then the, the problem becomes even more uh, serious when you want to make a very small computer. Because when, when you make the computer even smaller, uh, then first of all, the, the, the components become more sensitive. Uh, and they become less accurate, and then they also become less, more sensitive to noise. So even if there, there's an electron passing by, there, would be, there, can, there can be some error. And uh, yeah, so then the, the thing that you have to pay attention to is that uh, um, so even, if the, if you, even if you try to make uh, very accurate components that uh, make errors uh, very rarely with very, very, high, very low probability, uh, uh, if you have a lengthy computation, uh, well, with some probability, positive probability, there is going to be some error, and these errors will propagate and uh, will affect uh, the final result of computation. Yes? Yeah, you can think of it like that. That a result of the computation, or some. Um, uh, local computation should be zero or one, and then there is an error and it's flipped. It's, it gives you the wrong ans answer. Yeah. Um, so uh, around the middle of previous century, Shannon was considering the, pro the problem of uh, doing reliable communication through noisy channels, uh, which is a similar problem. And then at the same time, around the same time for Neumann, was considering uh, the problem of doing reliable computation with no noisy components. And uh, well, Shannon essentially figured out what is the answer. So, so, so he figured out that you can do com communication through a noisy channel reliably if you allow uh, some redundancy. So if, if you have constant redundancy, you can do communication reliably. Uh, for computation, is, the, the situation is more complicated. So for one thing, that there are different models of computation, and there are, there are some subtleties. So for the simplest, well, one of the simplest models of computation, which is uh, the logic circuits, so those are the gates of and, 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 uh, or gates, and et cetera, um, uh, already von Neumann partially solved the problem, and then other people just improved on it. And again, the, the answer is that yes, you can do reliable computation, but here you not need uh, logarithmic redundancy. So if you have a circuit of size n, then if you want to uh, simulate it with a reliable circuit, you have to use a circuit of size n log n. 
But yes, like I said, there are different models of computation. This is a model of parallel computation, but uh, um, without memory. But uh, so many different models of computation have been studied, and this, and this problem is a, like a widely studied problem. And uh, one model of computation that you can study the effect of noise uh, in it is the cellular automata that I'm going to talk about. Uh, and again, for this model of cell computation, uh, there's some solution for um, reliable computation in presence of noise, but the solution is very, very complicated, very sophisticated. In, practic in practice, you cannot use it because, because of the complication. Okay, uh, so let me tell you what is a cellular automaton. Maybe you have heard already what is a cellular automaton, but let me tell you what it is. So you, there are different ways to look at it, but uh, here we, are, we, we want to look at it as a model of computation in the same way that Turing machine is a model of computation. I don't know how many of you know what is a Turing machine. So it's a model of, uh, a mathematical model of an uh, ordinary computer. And cellular automata, are, you can also think of them as a, as a mathematical model of uh, a computer, but a parallel computer. And uh, these are mathematically uh, very nice. So the data is represented uh, in an array of uh, symbols, so let's say zeros and ones, or reds and blues. And this array can be one-dimensional, two-dimensional, or whatever. And it can be also either finite or infinite. Of course, in uh, practice, you only have finite computers, but uh, mathematicians, of course, they like to idealize and simplify, so they use infinite arrays. Yes, so you have the array of symbols, which is the data, and then the computation, the one step of the computation is to apply, to update every symbol simultaneously. And uh, the way that you, see, you update it is that you apply just a, a local rule uh, uh, at every site, simultaneously in parallel, and you get a new symbol for, for every site. And so, so this would give you a new symbol for this site, and then you apply it here, and then you apply it here, and all of them them on in parallel. And now, uh, the actual computation would be just the iteration of this transform. So this gives you a transformation on configurations, one configuration to another. And then if you iterate, this would correspond to the actual computation. Uh, yeah, so then, then just to let me point out that, emphasize that the rule that you apply is the same everywhere and at every time step. Okay, so. Yeah, so there are different reasons that these are attractive to mathematicians. Uh, one reason is that uh, you can also view them as dynamical systems. So they are, the space of all configurations is a compact metric space, and the transformation is a con nice continuous transformation. So you can use the machinery of uh, uh, dynamical systems and the ergodic theory to study them. And there is another reason that uh, they are uh, attractive, and that is uh, there's some kind of abstract similarity with nature. So for example, at every finite region, there is only finite amount of information, and the interactions are local, and et cetera. So, and, and also you can uh, implement other uh, physical features, such as conservation laws and uh, reversibility inside this uh, cellular automata. So, in particular, because of these uh, similarities, it, uh, um, they are convenient um, for, if you want to study the physical implementation, implementations of computers, these are um, particularly convenient models. Uh, yeah, so, so the, mm, the topic here is uh, the effect of noise in computation. So how do we model the effect of noise? If we just do it like this. So at every step of the computation, so every time we apply this transformation, afterwards uh, we apply noise. So let's say for at every uh, site independently, we modify uh, the symbol in, uh, according to some transition probabilities. So that would be a model of noise. We can, uh, we can consider different model of, models of noise, and this would be a simple version of it. So now, no, uh, we don't have a dynamical system anymore because it's a random transformation. Uh, but so 
this would be an example of what we call a probabilistic cellular automaton. And what is a probabilistic cellular automaton? It's just a, essentially the same thing as an ordinary cellular automaton, except, except that the, the rule is probabilistic. So uh, it gives you different symbols with different probabilities. Uh, and we, are, we also assume that uh, these updates are independent. This for, there are different reasons to want this. Uh, but now we don't have a dynamical system. We have a Markov process, discrete time Markov process. Again, so the, the state space is uncountable. But on the other hand, the, the transition probabilities are nice. So there, they have a failure property. There is a continuity property. So they are, again, nice kind of uh, Markov processes uh, that correspond to what in probability theory uh, call interacting particle systems. Interacting particle systems are usually the, the continuous time variants of this probabilistic cellular automata. OK, so now back to the problem of uh, reliable computation in presence of noise. So you can express it uh, informally in this setting uh, like this. So, so if you have a cellular automaton, let's call it T, you want to simulate this cellular automaton with another cellular automaton S uh, in such a way that so, so this new cellular automaton is, has some uh, resilience against noise. So I'm, I'm not going to get into what exactly I mean by simulation because it's a tricky business. But you can just think of it like this, that if you encode uh, the, the configuration of the original cellular automaton to some configuration of the new cellular automaton and apply the rule of uh, new cellular automaton that should correspond and then de decode it that should correspond to the application of the original cellular automaton. Okay, so this is our problem. Uh, but there is, a, there is a preliminary problem that uh, before, before being able to do, you, uh, solve this problem you have to be able to solve this new problem, this, this simpler problem. And that is the problem of uh, just remembering one bit of information in presence of noise. So you can just imagine that, I mean, typically, if you have a cellular automaton and you add noise, very, very soon, everything is lost to noise. So everything will become completely random. And this is a non -trivial, already a non-trivial problem to find a cellular automaton that is able to remember at least one bit of information uh, in presence of noise indefinitely for, in, for an indefinite amount of time. So, and this, the good thing about this is that in the language of Markov processes, this corresponds to the problem of ergodicity. And here, by ergodicity, I mean ergodicity in the, in the uh, sense of uh, Markov processes. So uh, a Markov process is ergodic if it has a, just one single invariant measure, and if, no matter where you start, you, the distribution converges to this uh, unique invariant measure. And you can imagine that this corresponds really to forgetting everything. So what we really want is to find some cellular automata that, in presence of noise, are non-ergodic uh, Markov processes. OK, so let me just mention some earlier work. So in dimensions two and higher, uh, there is a general construction, very, very nice construction by Andre Tom, uh, back from 1970s, um, which, uh, which has this property that it remembers a single bit of information uh, indefinitely. And uh, later, Peter Gatch and uh, Reif, they noticed that you can, they can use this uh, construction of Tom to to do actual simu uh, reliable simulation of computations. And, uh, but the thing is that if you have a d-dimensional so cellular automaton, you need two extra dimensions to achieve this reliability. And the idea is very simple. You just you use infinite amount of uh, redundancy. Uh, so, but this is, this is not practical. And uh, the reason is that when you build a computer, so you, cannot, you can never build a three-dimensional computer. Uh, so, for example, if you look at your computers, the chips, the, the, the uh, um, digital chips that are inside, they are al always one-dimensional. And the reason is that uh, when you do computation, the, the computation always generates heat, and there should be some pathways to get rid of heat. 
And so usually the third, third uh, dimension is used to get rid of heat. So this is a, mathematically it's a good uh, solution, but it's, it's not practical. And later, uh, Peter Gash uh, was able to find a one-dimensional cellular automaton, which is non-ergodic in presence of noise. Uh, in fact, his, his, uh, his uh, cellular automaton is able, able to simulate every other cellular automaton. Um, so it's very strong, very, very strong result. But the problem is that this construction is extremely, extremely complicated. And the number of symbols that they use, he uses for at every position is uh, astronomical. So it's, again, you cannot use it in practice. Okay, so now the, the idea that we had was to approach this problem from the other end and trying to narrow, narrowing down uh, the search. So we look for uh, properties that ensure that the cellular automaton in presence of noise is ergodic. Now, if you want to look for a non-ergodic cellular automaton, you have to avoid all these properties which, are, um, which guarantee ergodicity. Now, let me show you some examples, some simulations. So here, this is a one-dimensional cellular automaton. This is the uh, simulation of the non-noisy version, and this is the simulation with noise. So this is the, the first row is the, first, the initial configuration, and then the consecutive rows below it are the consecutive time steps. And uh, this particular example is very simple. It's just a uh, toy example. And it has, so you see, you see that there are diff three different uh, possible states at every side. So there's a white, and there's black, and there's gray. gray. And it has this pro particular property that no matter what you start with, after a finite number of steps, you get uh, all white. And in, so in a sense that this, even without noise, this cellular automaton is forgetting everything uh, after a few steps. And, uh, and then in presence of noise also, you see that the behavior is more or less similar, except that after, even after the initial configuration is uh, lost, there will be every now and then some burst of uh, other colors, other symbols, but they will disappear very soon. But here is a more interesting example. Again, there are uh, three different symbols per site. And um, uh, in this case, uh, white has this property that it propagates. So if you have a white at just one, sim uh, one site, then in the, uh, the following step, uh, it remains white, and also the neighboring sites will also become white. Uh, so, but, um, but still, in the areas which, where there is no site, there's something interesting going on. But then when you add noise, then of course, very quickly, there will be a positive, positive density of uh, white symbols. So very quickly, everything is erased. So the information about the initial condition is lost. Okay, so here's somewhat more interesting example. Yeah. This time we have five symbols. So there's a black and there's white and then three shades of uh, gray. And you can think of this, or you can just uh, imagine black as a wall. So it, there's no movement in, uh, in black. And the, the different shades of black, the shades of gray to, and together white with white, they encode uh, uh, different, different particles, particles that go to the left and particles that go to the right. And every particle that go, uh, reaches a, a wall, it bounces back. Just an uh, intuitive way to understand this. Uh, but in the, in the language of dynamical systems, this is, a, this is an example of a dynamical system which is almost equicontinuous. Now, if we add noise again, the position of these walls and the position of the particles will soon be randomized and uh, soon we'll, you will uh, forget everything about the initial condition. Okay, so here's the last example, which is a, uh, so, this is a, so without noise, this example, in this example, we, we see the formation of this uh, uh, fractal-like structures. And, uh, but if you add slight, uh, very small noise, then every, very quickly, everything becomes just complete noise. So it's, it's, um, but again, so again, you, you will see that uh, after a while, what you see is very, very, very different from 
the initial condition. So the initial condition is lost. So these were all examples of cellular automata that in presence of noise uh, become ergodic. So they, they, they lose their information. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, re-emphasize that typically you expect that uh, if you add noise to a cellular automaton, it becomes ergodic. But on the other hand, uh, it's usually quite challenging to prove this. Uh, even, even if you, you do the simulation and you see that there, there is, uh, it should be ergodic, then if you want to prove that, it's not so easy. Uh, and there, there's a, there are good reasons for it. Yeah, so there might be some algorithmic undecidability, but there's also a close connection with statistical mechanics at low temperature. And statistical mechanics at low temperature is where, this is when, where, when you have phase transitions and it's known to be very complicated, very difficult. Uh, yes, and another point is that even though you expect that typically you get ergodicity, that the mecha mechanism for this ergodicity could be different from one example to another. Um, okay, so let me show you a table of some results that we, had, we have had with Matthew Sablik and Irene Markovici. So these are different classes of cellular automata, and these, these are different models of noise. I haven't told you what are the exactly different, diff, these, these different models of noise, but you can imagine. Uh, and for each of these classes, so for example, if you have a nilpotent cellular automaton with small perturbation, this is a technical term, you get an, you get, uh, an ergodic Markov process. Or if you have a, a permutive cellular automaton with permutation noise, again, you get an ergodic system. Or if you have a surjective cellular automaton with, with uh, additive noise, you get an ergodic system. And, uh, and there are different, different techniques that you use. For, for example, for these, uh, you use cobbling arguments. And for these last two, we use uh, Fourier analysis. And, this, and for this uh, particular result, we use entropy. And this is the, the, the one that I like the most. So I'm going to tell you more about this. Uh, OK, so what's, what, it, what, it, what it says? So what, what do we mean by a surjective cellular automaton? Just means that the transformation is surjective. So it's a, every configuration has a pre-image. And what do we mean by additive noise? We mean just that at uh, every position, uh, independently, we add an independent uh, random value to the, to the current value. And we have to make it precise what exactly I mean by adding. So you can just identify your symbols with a, with an arbitrary group in the addition. Um, OK, so just a remark that both uh, uh, surjective cellular automaton, this transformation, and the noise, individually, they preserve the um, uniform Bernoulli measure. So that means that if I initialize the, the, the system with uh, independent coin flips, with fair coins, then that if I apply the cellular automaton map, then I get another random configuration which is indistinguishable from uh, independent coil flips. And the same with noise. So if I apply noise to this uh, random configuration, I get a random configuration which has the same distribution. Okay, now here's the, the statement of the theorem. So if I have a surjective cellular automaton, I perturb it with additive noise, uh, positive additive noise, uh, then the, the resulting Markov process is ergodic. And moreover, yeah, so it's ergodic with, and the unique invariant measure, of course, is the uniform Bernoulli measure. And moreover, the convergence is exponentially fast. Um, okay, so let me tell you something about uh, the interpretation of this uh, with regard to the original motivation. So the original motivation was computation in presence of noise. Right? So surjective cellular automaton is a really interesting class of cellular automaton and they're widely studied for one reason, that they include all cellular automata that are reversible. And by reversibility, we mean that there is another cellular automaton which undoes uh, the cellular automaton. 
And, uh, and uh, this reversibility has been also studied in computation theory uh, as a way to control um, heat generation. So at some point, uh, Landauer, in 1960s, Landauer was at, uh, at the IBM, so he noticed and, and formulated this, uh, what is known, nowadays known as the Landauer principle. And that is, uh, so that is the, the statement that uh, whenever you do computation, there is heat, inevitably some heat, heat production. And, uh, uh, and that's because, of, because when, so you are, you are, when you, are, you erase some bits of information, the information which you are, you are erasing essentially has to uh, add to the entropy of the environment. And that entropy, that uh, addition to the entropy of the environment appears as heat. But later, um, Charles Bennett and uh, Toffoli and Fredkin, they, uh, they noticed that, uh, so that this heat production is really, really only the, the part that uh, you, you erase information. And you can pre do pretty much everything reversibly, except for this uh, erasure of information. So what you can do is you can do uh, almost all of your computation reversibly, and then, but at the end, you get the, the final result together with some junk bits of information, which uh, you, don't, you are not interested in. So now, now you want to erase that, so you can just move it uh, far from the core of your computer and erase it there so that the, the heat is, can, be, can be removed. But, uh, okay, so let's see what, what this statement says. And it says that, so you, one interpretation is that if you have a reversible computer which has a structure like a cellular automaton, then if it is subject to noise, it uh, forgets uh, all, its info all information about software and data uh, exponentially fast. And in, in fact, you can, you can refine this. So if, uh, if you have a region of size n in your uh, lattice, then uh, this, it mixes after, after log n steps. This uh, becomes, it becomes very much, very close to complete noise, just uh, completely random bits of information. And uh, you, can, you can say similar thing for finite computers. So this, this was for infinite cellular automaton. And for finite uh, computers, parallel computers, you can say the same thing. So if you have a computer, a reversible computer with uh, n components, which are noisy, then in uh, uh, an order of log n steps, everything is lost to, to noise. So you can imagine that this is, this is a very drastic restriction to what you can do with uh, uh, this kind of reversible computers. Reversible. Of course, these are, this is a particular model of a reversible computer, but yeah, so maybe the um, implication of this is that if you, uh, if you want to have uh, a, a com reversible, so if you want to have a reliable computer which has a structure similar to cellular automaton, uh, it requires some degree of irreversibility. Okay. Uh, so I have some time. Let me tell you some uh, ideas about the proof because, because I, I, I mean, it's a, it's a nice idea and um, maybe it can be applied to different, in different contexts. So, the, the idea is that uh, this is, so do you, I don't know if you remember the last example that I showed. It was the, there was some fractal um, formation without noise, and the, when you added noise, uh, very quickly everything became like noise. And the idea is that uh, the ergodicity is because of the accumulation of noise. So the noise from the environment comes, enters the system, and it doesn't escape, and it just accumulates, and every, after a while everything is... Uh, mostly noise. And uh, so how, how can we measure this accumulation of information is you just measure it with entropy. Uh, and what do I mean by entropy? Let's just a reminder. So if you have a random variable, a discrete random variable, uh, this is its entropy. So it's a 
just the definition, but uh, uh, intuitively it measures the average amount of information that is present in this random variable. Um, maybe I will come back to this, so, but let me tell you that uh, the main idea is that you consider the effect of the cellular automaton and the effect of noise separately, and the cellular automaton, the, the surjective cellular automaton does not erase inf any information, it only diffuses it, whereas uh, the additive noise uh, increases the, uh, the entropy. And then you can, you can uh, uh, write a lower bound for the amount of entropy which is in a finite set, finite region of the space. And this will converge exponentially fast to the maximum cap capacity of that region minus some uh, boundary term. And then the, there's an, one extra uh, step of the argument that you, you, have, you, you're, you can show that this is enough for ergodicity. Maybe I will come back to this if I have time. Okay, so here's an extension of this uh, result. So that was for surjective cellular automata with uh, uh, additive noise, so the particular type of noise. But then you can extend this. That, uh, if you have a more general uh, notion of noise, it's just a zero range noise, every site is independently modified. Uh, then again, we have ergodicity, but provided that both the cellular automaton and the noise preserve the same Bernoulli measure. So maybe this time the Bernoulli measure is not uniform, but it has a different parameter. It's a biased, it's a, uh, yes, it comes from biased uh, coin flips. But yeah, so if both the noise and the cellular automata preserve the same Bernoulli measure, we have ergodicity. And here, Instead of entropy, it's essentially the same kind of proof, but, uh, but instead of entropy, we have to use some uh, skewed version of entropy. That in the statistical mechanics, they call it pressure, because it's connected to pressure. And then you, know, you, you can uh, use uh, a characterization of surjective cellular automata that preserve a particular Bernoulli measure, and then and you are done. And then, uh, Okay, so this is the definition of pressure, but it's not important. Uh, you can extend this even, even further. Now this becomes, this is not related to the original problem of computation with noise. This is more like a ma of mathematical interest or, uh, so if you have a probabilistic cellular automata which has positive rates, so every transition has positive probability, and it preserves some Bernoulli measure then it's, it is necessarily ergodic. You can use this essentially the same t technique, but you have some extra. Uh, and you can do the same thing with uh, continuous time. Uh, let me tell you some, uh, well, mm, okay, so this, this, there were some partial results of this type uh, before, so there was, uh, of course this generalizes the previous results, but there was also result of Vasiliev, very old result, uh, that said the same thing but only for a class of uh, probabilistic cellular automata which have this property. And um, yeah, so and then this entropy method is also not new. So entropy method is, really goes back to Boltzmann in some form. And in, for Markov processes on lattice systems, such as probabilistic cellular automata or continuous time versions, and they were pioneered by uh, Holly and Kozlov and Vasiliev. But, uh, so there's one feature that in most of the earlier proofs using entropy, uh, that is, um, so usually when you, want, you use the entropy method, you require translation invariance of your measures. So you cannot, you, you usually cannot say anything about what happens if you start with an arbitrary configuration, but you can you, you, you say only things about uh, what if you start with a random configuration which has a stationary distribution, shift to stationary distribution. But this um, argument that we have does, doesn't have this restriction. It works without the translation invariance uh, limitation. Okay, so 
so there are two conjectures. That are, these are, again, completely uh, non-relevant to the problem of computation with noise, but they are relevant in the context of uh, statistical mechanics. So and the idea is that, so here, uh, so this theorem says something about probabilistic cellular automata that preserve a Bernoulli invariant measure. And you can ask what, what happens if you have your cellular automaton preserves a different, a more general class of measures, in particular Gibbs measures. So Gibbs measures are the ones that are uh, important in statistical mechanics. And here, the conjecture would be that it's not necessarily ergodic because uh, Gibbs measures, I mean, there can be multiplicity of Gibbs measures. But still, you would have some convergence towards the set of Gibbs measures. Maybe if you did, uh, this was uh, quite far from the rest. You don't need to. Um, OK, so let me tell you more about this entropy method. And what, a, what better uh, approach than to give you the simplest example where it applies? And an example that I think most people are familiar with, and that is the convergence theorem of finite, finite state Markov chains. Right, so if you have a finite state Markov chain which is irreducible and aperiodic, then we know that it's, uh, so there is a standard theorem that it says that uh, we have, it has a unique invariant measure and it has convergence towards its unique invariant measure, exponential convergence. Uh, and I know at least three different proofs of this. I don't know, if, maybe if some of you know different proofs, and I would be very interested to know more proofs of this. So there is a standard proof, algebraic proof using paramphropidinus, and there is a proof by, by a coupling. And then there is this less, uh, less famous proof using entropy. Uh, may I ask you whether, whether you have seen this entropy argument for, uh, for this proof of this convergence here? So, good. So then I will tell you what it is, because it's very simple. So then let me uh, recall you what is, it, what is entropy. So we have a discrete random variable which takes values in a finite set. Uh, uh, and the entropy of this random variable is some, has some expression, and, but it measures the average amount of information that uh, uh, random variable. Uh, and this is really, this should be really the, the definition. So you can formulate it without this uh, weird ex expression, and then you deduce this expression. Uh, but it's, it has intuitive properties that you can expect. So, uh, first of all, the entropy of a random variable, it quantifies the amount of information, so it's non-negative. And uh, it is maximized precisely when uh, this random variable is uh, uniformly distributed. And the maximum value is just the logarithm of the size of this set sigma. Uh, and furthermore, we have this kind of chain rule. So if you have uh, several random variables and you want to know the joint entropy of them, so you can just decompose it as, as the, the entropy of the first random variable plus the entropy of the second va random variable if we know the value of the, the first random variable. I mean, of course, I have to define what is this conditional entropy, but there's a, there's a convenient definition for that that make, uh, makes this uh, chain will work. And lastly, so, so this, uh, of course, this is a, this is a intuitive no notation, but really entropy is, not, is, a, the, is a function of the distribution of this random variable. And as a, as a function of this uh, uh, distribution, it's a continuous function. OK, so let's prove the convergence theorem for uh, finite state Markov chains. So let's say we have a Markov chain sequence of random variables. It has a particular transition matrix, uh, and it has a state space. So this is a finite state space, and this is a transition matrix. It tells you what is the probability of going from one state to another state. If you are in one state, what is the chance of transition to another state? And uh, for simplicity, I assume that this Markov chain has the uniform distribution as a stationary distribution. So this is not really necessary, but just it simplifies. I can use directly uh, entropy. If I, if 
uh, the, the stationary distribution is not uniform, then I have to use a, a skewed version of entropy. So, so the first fact, uh, if I have two random variables that are connected by this transition matrix, and here I really mean what you can expect. So, so uh, A is arrow B, but by this I mean that uh, the conditional probability of B having some, some value given A having some value is just given by this uh, uh, transition matrix. There. So it's like uh, jumping from A to B according to the transition matrix. So if we have two random variables that are connected by this uh, transition matrix, then the entropy of the second one is at least the entropy of the first one. Uh, furthermore, if the transition matrix is strictly positive, all these transition probabilities are positive, strictly positive, no, none of them is zero, then we can say even more that uh, not only we have this inequality, but also the equality here appears only if the uh, first random variable is uniformly distributed. So if, if a, the first random variable A is not uniformly distributed, then in this inequality is strict. Okay, now proof of the convergence theorem. So there is a standard argument that we can reduce the general case to the case where this uh, transition matrix is strictly positive. Now, if you look at the sequence of entropies of this, uh, the states of the Markov chain, this is an increasing sequence. It, it increases, but on the other hand, it is also bounded by the maximum capacity, maximum, uh, by the, um, the, the entropy of the uniform distribution. So it has to converge. It has to converge to some value. So let's call it M. Now, there are two cases. If the if M is exactly the maximum value, then you can argue using continuity of the entropy that uh, there is a convergence. The, the random variables are converging to the uniform distribution. If on the other hand, this random variable is uh, strictly smaller than the maximum capacity, then you can use compactness and again continuity to, to find some, a pair of, conf pair of random variables, which are again uh, connected by this transition matrix, and uh, they have the same entropy, and this same entropy is strictly less than uh, the maximum capacity. And this is a contradiction with this second property. Yes, because if these two random variables are connected by the, run, by the uh, transition matrix and they have the same distribution, uh, this uh, they have to both, both be uniformly distributed, so it cannot happen. Okay, so let me um, remind you that in the, so the, so the, the, mark, in the convergence theorem of Markov chains, uh, you, not only, you, you, you not only have convergence, but you have exponential convergence. So convergence is exponentially fast. And this follows, I mean, of course, if you use, for example, peron frubinius theory approach, then it follows very naturally. But in this theorem, this approach doesn't show you directly the exponential convergence. Uh, it does if you slightly modify it, so it's maybe you refine it. And this refinement is a key to the proof of our original theorem. And the refinement is that if you have, a, again, a positive transition matrix, then there exists a positive constant uh, such that whenever you have um, two random variables that are connected by, with uh, this transition matrix, then you, you can give an explicit lower bound on the amount of, uh, on how much the entropy of B is larger than the entropy of A. So you'll notice this is just a, a convex combination of the entropy of A and the, the maximum capacity. Of course, if the entropy of A is smaller than the maximum capacity, this is larger than the entropy of A. Now, if you apply this instead of the previous version, then you can give an explicit lower bound for the entropy of the Markov chain after t steps. 
and this would be like, a, like this. So there would be a maximum capacity, the entropy of the uniform distribution, minus some term which grows exponentially fast. This, this term goes, goes exponentially fast to zero. So you get also exponential convergence to, uh, to, the, max, to the maximum capacity. And this, com, com, this uh, will also imply exponential convergence of the distribution of the Markov chain. OK, so uh, do I still have some time? Uh, Five minutes, okay. Okay, so let's uh, let me give you some further details about the original problem. So the the, the theorem, the theorem of that says that it, the claim the ergodicity of the perturbation of a surjective cellular automaton with noise, with uh, additive noise. And uh, first of all, just a reminder again that the uniform Bernoulli measure is stationary because it's. St it is preserved by, both by the cellular automaton and the noise. And uh, now, in order to prove ergodicity, in order to, com to prove convergence to the uniform, distribu uniform Bernoulli distribution, it is enough to, sh to say that for every finite window, if I look at the distribution of this pattern over time, this distribution converges to the uniform distribution. Uh, uh, yes. And in particular, that, that happens if the entropy of this finite pattern, the finite uh, random pattern, uh, goes to ma its maximum capacity, which is just uh, the size of this window times the maximum capacity of a single site, single, uh, single symbol. Uh, now, like I said so before, uh, the idea is to consider the effect of this random, the cellular automaton and the noise separately. And the effect of the surjective cellular automaton is just that it diffuses the entropy. It, it doesn't erase entropy. And what do I mean by this? Uh, one way to express this fact is that if I look at, uh, so let's say this is, uh, if I look at the uh, entropy of this part compared to the entropy of this part, so this, this entropy is uh, at least as large as the entropy of this part, minus some uh, term which is of order of the boundary of this set J. And, uh, and this is, I mean, just to interpret it as diffusion, you can imagine that there, there is a possibility that some information goes out through the boundary, and this, that, that, uh, that amount of information that can go out is uh, estimated by this, uh, this term. Um, and second, the effect of additive noise. And you can, you can so, so if you, have, you know the entropy of this part, then the entropy of this part, you, for the entropy of this part, you can write an explicit lower bound. And this is really nothing more than this, this bound. So applying this bound on a larger scale gives you this lower bound on the amount of uh, uh, Extra, inform, extra entropy that you get by applying noise. Uh, so now if you combine these, these two, you get, that, you get this explicit lower bound uh, for the amount of uh, entropy, for the entropy of uh, this finite window after one, one time step in terms of the entropy, the current entropy. So it's like this, and this is a, uh, the effect of noise and minus the F minus some boundary term. Now, if you iterate this, you get that you get a lower bound for the entropy of this finite window after after finitely many uh, transitions, and it would be like this. So it would be uh, if the term which is which goes exponentially fast. So this this factor goes exponentially fast to one. So this term, the first term, goes exponentially fast to the maximum capacity of uh, uh, this, this region. So the, and then there's, there's this extra uh, correction term due to the boundary. And now, uh, but this is much, much smaller, of course. This is boundary term. Um, and then there's, there's, there's one extra step that you have to do. 
that uh, you have to you you can you can use uh, some kind of a bootstrapping argument to show that uh, if the entropy satisfies this, then it also satisfies a similar expression, but without the boundary term. And it, it will follow that it really the entropy is going to this maximum capacity. So we get convergence to the uniform distribution. Uh, okay, so that's essentially as much as I wanted to talk about. So let me just remind you some keynotes. Uh, so the original motivation of this uh, project was that we want to understand uh, how to do uh, reliable computation in presence of noise using cellular automata. And uh, uh, then in this, with this interpretation, the ergodicity of probabilistic cellular automata correspond to forgetfulness, the total forgetfulness of uh, initial condi condition. And one uh, implication of one of the results was that if you want to do reliable computation, some degree of irreversibility is necessary, at least for if you want to use certain type of computer structures. And finally, there's was this entropy method. Let me let me stop here. Okay. Thank you for your attention.